Hi, everyone, and welcome to Building Back Better, how investing in employee ownerships creates resiliency for workers, businesses, and local economies. My name is Allison Powers. I am the Manager of Cooperative and Community Initiatives at Capital Impact Partners, and I want to introduce my colleagues, Allison Lingain, co-founder of Project Equity, and Todd Leverett, co-principal of APIS and Heritage Capital Partners. Today, we're going to talk about how employee ownership has been gaining traction as a tool for business wealth, for building wealth and assets for workers with low wages and communities of color. This is especially relevant as a country faces a wave of small business closers as baby boomer retires, baby boomers retire, and of course, the health and economic crisis that we've all been facing. We feel that conversions to employee ownership, where the business owners sell their business to the workers, preserve jobs, stabilize communities, and ultimately create more resilient businesses. And we're excited to talk more about this with you today. First, we're gonna introduce our organizations, give you some background and context on employee ownership, and then I will moderate a discussion. Hopefully we'll have time for a question or two at the end. So first I will introduce my organization and then hand it over to Todd. Again, my name is Allison Powers. I work for Capital Impact Partners. We are a mission-driven organization, a CDFI focused on engaging communities to increase equity and opportunity. We do this through a variety of tools, including deploying capital, capacity building, grant making and policy. We have dispersed 2.7 billion since 1982 in affordable housing, aging, education, healthcare, food access, and cooperative and employee owned businesses. We are invested in this space for similar reasons as our partners, quality jobs, small business resilience, wealth creation. And we also have a deep focus on equity and bridging the racial wealth gap, both in our external work and also internally. We are one of the larger CDFIs, and, um, but we also have grants so we can support smaller, more innovative pro projects. So now I will hand it over to Todd to talk about APIS and Heritage. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening to everybody. My name is Todd Leverett, and I'm co-founding partner at APIS and Heritage Capital Partners. Um, and we, along with our partners at the Democracy at Work Institute, are, are doing what we see as our reimagining of entrepreneurship and wealth building in the United States um, by focusing the powerful tools of employee ownership on BIPOC and, and immigrant workforces. And so what does that mean? What do we actually do? Well, APIS and Heritage Capital Partners is actually a, a impact focus uh, fund sponsor um, that is now operating and running Legacy Fund One, which is a soon to be uh, $50 million impact fund that invests in closely held, privately held small businesses in the United States with large BIPOC workforces, and we convert those businesses over to employee-owned enterprises using a, a, a mix of the, the ESOP form of, of corporate governance, as well as the, the co-op principles of culture inside a firm. So really bringing the best from the world of employee stock ownership plans, ESOPs, the best from the world of co-ops, um, democratic governance, democratic management, and bringing it together to help build wealth for workers of color as well as build high quality jobs for workers of color and help keep businesses and jobs anchored in the communities in which they exist today. So really happy to be on the line with you all today and I will pass it over to Allison. Excellent, thanks to you both and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I am Allison Lingain, I'm the co-founder of Project Equity and we are a national nonprofit, um, super, super aligned with the work of both Capital Impact and APIS and Heritage. Um, you know, we exist really because we believe that there is an incredible untapped power in employee ownership to bridge some of the biggest challenges that we have in our economy around income and wealth inequality and specifically racial income and wealth and racial um, wealth inequality. So um, we'll get into a bit about the power of employee ownership and why we're such firm believers in it. But we we see that some of the biggest gaps are our number one awareness. People just don't know about employee ownership. So so we do a lot of of raising the awareness, talking about it, um, engaging. And we do also believe that there is a, a capital gap. Um, and so we'll get into that as well. And I'm just super excited to be talking about this topic with you all. So back over to you, Allison, or should I jump right in? Um, why don't you jump right in to this? Okay, wonderful. So, oh, my, trying to get to my next slide. So give me a second while I make sure I know how to navigate. Here we go. 
Okay, so um, I'm gonna open by sharing a quick story about employee ownership to demonstrate what we mean by employee ownership, offering us the chance to build back better and to create resiliency. So this is California Solar Electric. They're one of Project Equity's clients. They're based in rural Northern California. Early in the pandemic, they furloughed their entire workforce as many small businesses did so they could tap on employment. Now, while on furlough, the team came together to figure out how to keep their company afloat in spite of the mass, in spite of the massive disruptions. And so they innovated. In fact, they launched a brand new line of business. They became resellers for battery energy storage. They were not only able to rehire, but they grew their team and increased their wages by over 20%. CalSolar is not alone. This is not a single not unrepeated anecdote. Study after study on employee-owned companies um, uh, show this resiliency. And during the pandemic, there were studies that showed that employee-owned companies compared to non-employee-owned companies retained four times as many jobs, prioritized employee safety and, safety and generally did better than their non-employee-owned peers. And this is because of the employee engagement and focus. So looking at workers more broadly, um, and, and we, we know the storyline, right? People who we started during the pandemic calling essential workers actually live teetering right on the edge. I won't read the stats on the slide, um, but we know that income inequality in the United States is shocking, but wealth inequality is even more shocking. And this is the gap that undergirds it all, that really holds people back, that is so hard to overcome in a low wage job and that with just a little bit of improvement can make such a tremendous difference for individuals, for their families and their communities. Racial income and wealth inequality underpins the core of what is broken and presents our biggest need. Employee ownership in contrast, <clears throat> excuse me, employee ownership in contrast creates um, the quality jobs that build intergenerational wealth. A 2017 study from the National Center for Employee Ownership shows that median wages at employee-owned businesses are 33% higher. Workers stay at their jobs half again as long, so these are more stable jobs and workplaces, and wealth as measured by household net worth is nearly twice as high. What we are talking about is a transition where the, the broad, in which the broad base of employees becomes owner. The seller gets liquidity at a fair price. And really relevant to this conversation about capital, the employees do not need capital themselves for these transactions to happen. Essentially, the business pays off the employee stake over time from the profits. Profits today are, in addition, shared um, with the workers. Another client of ours, a slice of New York based in Silicon Valley. They're basically two pizza shops with over 30 workers. They distributed over half a million dollars of profit to their workers um, the first two years after they became employee owned. Another quick story here, um, Sarah Vegas of um, Niles Pie, which is um, a, a company in you know, the food service business. She shared that her first profit sharing check, which was over $9,000, was the biggest check she had ever received. She's worked in food service her whole career, which is a notoriously challenging sector, whether you think of it um, from a low wage perspective or schedule or job stability. Um, and this single profit sharing check translates to what would be a 30% increase over a $15 minimum wage. So the, the, the conversation today is not about whether employee ownership delivers impact but instead we're focused on how can we get more of it so that its deep impact can be spread further. And we're talking today about the roles that capital can play in creating more employee-owned companies. So we wanna just um, kind of close this, this opening with a brief video and bear with me while I stop my sharing and move over to another screen. Um, one second here. Almost there. Yes. My friend, Ren Bogiren, to join me on the screen. Um, I've had the pleasure He helped his company, A Slice of New York, transition to become a worker cooperative in 2017. And um, they've done incredible things since then, including 
not only surviving, but actually, um, you know, really innovating and managing to thrive in the midst of this pandemic. So Ren, I want to welcome you and, and just start off by asking you to share a little bit about how a slice of VR has fared during the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be with you all today. And, uh, you know, it's been a crazy time for everyone, I would say. But it's a time where we all have to learn to adapt. So even before shelter in place had gone through, uh, my colleagues, Kurt, Joseph, and I all proactively met like a band to make a decision to prepare for a shutdown. So once the shutdown actually hit, the key moves that we made were to stop selling slices, to reconfigure the layouts of our shops, as well as stop dining. The main goal of this was to keep everyone safe. Now, this was a definite hit in our profit and loss statements. And to add to damage, we lost our lunch rush due to shelter in place and had to eliminate items such as uh, salads and tap the beer from our Sunnyvale shop. But what we found was that people were ordering anywhere between two to four whole pizzas at a time between four to nine o'clock with at least four to five lines on hold at the same time with wait times up to almost two hours. So we had to collectively rewire the way both our shops functioned in terms to find a recipe for success and a streamlined process. And one of the coolest things that actually happened was one of our owners, as well as our non-owners collaborated together and proposed that we should make a personal 10 inch pizza that could be taken out fresh or taken home frozen so that we could minimize that loss between not being able to sling slices out to our actual guests. Wow, and, and your name is A Slice of New York and I think the tagline is New York Pizza in the Bay Area. So I know that slices are a big deal for you guys. So that really shows a significant adjustment and a lot of um, innovation. It really does. And, um, you know, coming back to the pop and loss statement, you know, we, we were learning a lot through our uh, data analysis. Angela is our CFO and she was collaborating with us to help us take a look at the key performance indicators, KPIs that were generating profits for us. So anywhere between how many pizzas we were actually selling and what kind were they, uh, what should we be prepping on and focusing on in order to have a more streamlined, refined process and to actually prepare for one big massive dinner rush rather than uh, just waiting for the time to pass by. We had to reallocate all of our hours. What I think though was one of the coolest moves we're trying to provide in terms of live data analytics for both shops is to get the key data points that our crew would like to know by simply using an iPad or a tablet in order to understand what is making us profitable. And, um, you know, what we found is when people are seeing what we're losing in profit, they want to find out how we can drive the profit back up by actually seeing, you know, where, where, where are we actually making the sales at and where can we compensate? Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's really, I think, one of the greatest promises of employee ownership is that it engages everybody across the company and it makes everyone more successful. Okay, so um, we just we wanted to, to lay some groundwork with you all before we get into our conversation um, about why we're such firm believers in the power of employee ownership and um, to have folks really get a sense of, of you know, what, what makes it um, so powerful. So, so hopefully that's, uh, hopefully we've, we've accomplished some of that and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Great. Well, sorry, Todd, did you want to interject? Okay. Uh, well, thanks so much for that context setting, Allison. I'm going to speak for just a few minutes about CDFIs, community development, financial institutions, and the landscape, and then I will moderate some questions. If you, the audience, has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end. I know somebody already asked one in the chat, which I collected. So um, as I said before, I work for Capital Impact Partners and we are a CDFI or Community Development Financial Institution. Uh, CDFIs are dedicated to delivering responsible, affordable lending to underestimated communities. I think one thing that is special about CDFIs is they also include some sort of technical assistance or kind of handholding during the loan process, and they have a deep understanding of their target sectors or communities. 
there have been a small group of CDFIs that have been working in the employee ownership space for a long time. And, and I think they're unique because they collaborate really well together, uh, which is kind of the you know, cooperative employee ownership uh, ethos or spirit. Uh, but for most of the CDFIs, this is a new and emerging model. Um, there have been several of our CDFI partners who have uh, gotten in touch with us to try to better understand the model and the issues around the model, such as the personal guarantee, which we do not require. Um, and just to say that there are many CDFIs that are, are really interested in the model, especially those that are do, already doing small business lending and employee owned businesses are really not that far of a stretch. I mean, there's a lot more similarities than differences. Uh, one thing we tell CDFIs when they approach us that uh, something that's really important Important is partnering with a technical assistance provider that really understands the model. Uh, one of the primary ways to mitigate risks, I think, for a CDFI or an investor is to have strong support structures and technical assistance both during the transition but also on an ongoing basis. I also wanted to highlight a trans transaction that we did this year, a um, you know, employee owned, what is now an employee owned business called Ward Lumber in New York State. We worked with our longtime partner, the Cooperative Fund of New England. It was a 130 year old business that had been family owned, but then they ended up selling it to their 40 workers. Uh, this transaction had many partners and funding sources, including multiple lenders, technical assistance providers, state agencies. There was a lot of collaboration and flexibility that was needed to get the deal across the finish line. And I think that's this is something that this kind of working together um, and CDFIs are good at. Um, and this transaction really has to develop a new loan product for employee owned businesses and will help, which will help to really institutionalize and increase our lending in the space. In general, I think this is a really exciting time for employee ownership. There are much more CDFIs engaged in the model, as I've said, um, and also some really innovative new funds, which we're going to you know, get a little bit more into today, that have been uh, created and that really couple capital and technical assistance together. We're also seeing more investment by philanthropy and also investors that want to direct more investment. Um, directly into employee-owned businesses. There's also some promising legislation that would allow employee-owned businesses to much more easily access SBA programs and loan guarantees. And so in general, it seems that employee ownership is really having a moment, especially during this recovery and how we envision what we want a more sustainable, just economic landscape to look like moving forward in the future. So now I will ask our two panelists, Todd and Allison, a few questions about their specific initiatives. Uh, the first being, how have you centered racial and social equity in your work? Um, I, Todd, I you can start? Ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and start it off. Uh, great question, Allison. Um, you know, the, the, the racial and social equity piece, really the, the racial equity piece and the racial wealth gap was really the the impetus that that statistic that the average you know white family in the U.S. has between seven and ten times the wealth of the average um, black and Latinx family, and by some measures thirty to forty times the wealth, depending on what you're you're taking into consideration. That was the beginning of all this work. Um, I began my employee ownership work with a small CDF uh, small nonprofit in Detroit called C2BE. Uh, went to another nonprofit, national nonprofit, the Democracy at Work Institute which is our incubating partner and TA partner. And DOWI, the Democracy at Work Institute, really focuses on how employee ownership can be used to help uh, groups of folks who haven't had access to a lot of the, the traditional benefits of the American economy, from you know, people of color to immigrants, to folks who may live in, in rural communities, really focus on how to bring the promise of employee ownership to those people. And so, and so my mandate was to figure out how to help scale up employee ownership models with, with larger size companies, companies that may traditionally be more the target of, of M&A or, or private equity. Um, and, and so all that to say, you know, that fact, the, the racial wealth gap um, is what we, we were looking to address in a way that was not only clearly impactful um, from a wealth buildup, but that was also scalable and sustainable. So how can we create an investment model where there would be uptake, not just by folks in the 
in the in the um, the kind of the nonprofit world or the, or the impact world. But can we create a model where and, and this is part of our, our longer term vision, you know, uh, three, four five, 10 years down the line, your large pension funds, large insurance companies, uh, m- municipal, you know, municipal actors and players are saying, hey, we're able to invest in a model that's going to address the racial wealth gap and the wealth gap generally. No, all the workers in the, in the firms that we look to acquire will benefit from the employee ownership. We, again, focus on those firms with large workforces of color. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, how do we help build wealth for these workers? How do we help keep jobs stabilized in the cities and the states and the communities where they are? How do we help keep those companies and those jobs there? And we really, we're, we're starting to see that 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 vision is is uh, coming true. So l- long way around it, racial wealth gap is where we started and is where we'll, where we'll always be, so. Allison? Allison, you're muted. Um, yeah, just love everything that you were just saying, Todd, and, um, you know, just tremendous amount of alignment um, from Project Equity's perspective. You know, we we got started in this work um, almost eight years ago formally and, um, uh, you know, with a real focus on, on targeting industries with frontline workers with the assumption that by doing that, we could um, target companies with majority or significant um, uh, workers of color. And depending on the industry and the geography, um, that that's, can be easier or harder, but we have found that it, it's actually more complicated than that, as you might imagine. And especially when you're really trying to target um, black workers in particular. So, um, you know, black workers in the US make out, up about 12% of the total employment and they're underrepresented in small business employment. In fact, one in five black workers is employed in the public sector. So, um, you know, there it, it really takes a targeted effort to identify, you, you You can't just just look for any company with frontline workers. And so, um, you know, the work that we do at Project Equity were very data data driven to try and you know target companies and um, you know we've we've taken the approach of kind of doing a, a heat map or looking for hotspots if you will um, which we do in a, a few ways you know one is geographic hotspots where there's a combined density of black workers and black owned businesses so the overlay of those two meaning you're more likely to, to in small businesses to have a, a concentration of, of black workers and you know in our work we have we do have some regional focus areas and the regions that make up our black employee ownership initiative include Miami Atlanta um, Milwaukee from a density perspective, Los Angeles just from a numbers perspective. Um, and we're also looking at other regions based on further industry specific targeting. So for example, Texas is an important state for black workers in the manufacturing sector. Um, so then the other the other way we think about this in terms of hotspots is um, you know supply chains that have minority business enterprise preferences whether they're government or private sector. Um, and we have an active pilot right now with Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the largest health systems in the US in partnership with Obron Cooperative to figure out how to engage with companies that are suppliers. So partner with, with the, you know, the, the company, Kaiser Permanente, targeting their suppliers. Um, suppliers generally targeting A, either diverse suppliers, but B also, suppliers that could become diverse suppliers. You know, Allison Powers was talking about the demographic shift of business ownership in the United States. We know that one out of every two privately held companies with employees is on track to need a succession plan because their owner is 55 or older. So um, when you think about supply chain resiliency, whether it's in government or private sector, um, we need to be taking into account that probably one out of every two of those companies is gonna need to do an ownership transition. So let's put the opportunity of employee ownership in front of those businesses and get them to transition and also help the diversity of the supplier, the supply chain within those companies. Um, And then just one one other quick um, mention is that we have a partnership with Morehouse College um, and we'll be publishing a white paper uh, probably in the first part of 2022. Um, really to outline how communities, private sector, the nonprofit sector can leverage employee ownership transitions to increase economic security and support equitable wealth building in the black community. 
Thanks so much to both of you. My next question is around the current opportunities. What is your vision for a new economy that is based on restorative, just economy? Go for it, Ted. I think you are on mute. Great. After, I'll start the first one after you. I'll pick up after you. Go right ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, restorative, just economy, like that's that's why I'm in this. <laughs> you know, that's why we, we started. Um, Project Equity, you know, the, the reason ultimately that I am such a firm believer in employee ownership is frankly, it's the only strategy that I have found that enables any worker, you know, not just somebody who's highly ed educated and, you know, has, you know, big, lots of, of sort of social network connections, um, but any worker to get a job um, and through that job have the kind of access to opportunity and wealth that you know, white collar workers who are also mostly white take for granted in their jobs, right? So opportunity both professionally um, and opportunity from a financial perspective. And, and it's a setup that creates these opportunities in a win-win relationship between the employer and the employee. And it doesn't require outside regulation for companies to do well by their workers. So it's this model that like when I first heard about it, you know, I heard about it after I'd gone to business school and I'd been in working in mission driven companies for, you know, a decade and a half. And um, I was like, oh, my gosh, where's this been all my life? Somebody commented that. Why haven't I heard about this before? Um, you know, so it is it is this this opportunity that truly is a win, win, win. And so so that's that's why to me, the question really is great. How do we get more of it? <laughs> how do we how do we scale this model that that has such powerful benefits? And and frankly, is, I think, one of the, the ways that we can make some important changes in our economy to make it more just um, and make it more restorative. Excellent. And, and you know, I, I, Allison, what you were what you were describing I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, that was what the American dream was supposed to be now, whether the American dream was really accessible to everybody in America and who was, we, we, you know, there's a deeper story there. But I think, I think this concept, um, that's not a new concept of you, if you leave your house and leave your family and go to work and put in a, a full day's work and you do that to the, to the best of your ability, you should be able to, to provide, you know, uh, adequate housing, have adequate food, adequate health care, give your, your children an opportunity at, at you know, education or, or to go into a, 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 the trade that you went into. Like this whole kind of concept of, of working, the dignity of work itself and being able to live a dignified life and have your family live a dignified life if you're willing to go out there and, and put in the energy and effort, as opposed to the the sometimes it seems like the new American dream is that one of us can become a billionaire <laughs> at some point. And, you know, we really don't know what happens to everybody else. I, what, what you're describing, I think, is what, what we're all trying to, that concept, really make that a, a reality um, for, for, for everyone or, or make it available to all uh, working people across the economy through what we're trying to do. So I think that that vision of folks being able to go work and, and live a dignified life is, is that, that larger vision for for a new economy based on um, based off, off of these principles. I, I'll say this: I think it's important to note that you know, as a as a developing country, uh, the U.S. is behind a lot of other places in the world as far as developing a, a cult, uh, an economy that has a significant sector based around an employee ownership. And, and don't get me wrong, there's you know, there's six seven thousand ESOP companies across the U.S. There's a lot of companies that aren't majority employee owned, but but have employee ownership aspects to as part of the job benefits. I think the world of Silicon Valley and their use of options to incentivize workers, you know, in some way speaks to the, the power of aligning incentives of workers and companies. Um, you know, there's there's several hundred cooperative businesses, probably more, actually probably more than several hundred, four to five hundred cooperative businesses across the US. So it's there. It's there. I think what we're seeing now is, a, is an opportunity for, for this part of the economy to be more vocal and to start bringing more companies and more workers into the fold in a way that's equitable, in a way that's that's just. Um, and, and so that's Allison and Allison, you know this, if you don't, if if you don't call out racial equity, if if you don't call it out, if you don't make it a part of your mission vision, if you don't have your metrics, if you don't track it, you don't measure it, all the things you're doing to create a better economy 
are just as likely to leave out all the folks who've had the most difficulty in accessing um, uh, the economy and the benefits that come with it. So, you know, the fact that we're all calling it out and I think we need to push everybody else to call that out as well. And, and I think it's 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 happening more than it's happened in the, in the recent past. So really excited about that. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll stop there. Well said, well said. Yeah, people seem so hungry for it right now because, you know, we all knew about all the cracks in our society, but the pandemic made them <laughs> so, I mean, made them canyons and, and just so obvious. Uh, so I love hearing about your visions for the future. Um, and I'm going to pivot and ask some questions around the role of capital. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the barriers to access capital for these sort of transactions and, and you know, what sort of gaps you're trying to fill. Why don't you go, Todd? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick us off. I saw somebody in the chat. They, they made the statement, uh, uh, why have I never heard of this before? <laughs> like, why why is this, you know, one of the first times I've ever hearing about this concept? And I kind of tell this this story and I'll make it quick. So I, I have an undergraduate uh, business degree from Morehouse College, by the way. And my co-founder my co and co-principal at a &H also went to Morehouse College. So no better school to be partnering with on, on anything in this country uh, than, than Morehouse College. So, you know, undergraduate business degree, um, was on Wall Street, worked in, in finance for a large bulge bracket uh, bank, uh, went to graduate school, got a graduate business degree and a graduate law degree. And really the first time in my life that I that I heard about employee ownership as a as a real option for business owners, um, for workers, for communities, for investors. The first time it really came into the into the view, into my my site was working at the C2B, the small nonprofit in Detroit, Michigan. So I think when we talk about why, you know, what are some of the barriers to not just capital, but what are the barriers to the whole ecosystem of employee ownership? A lot of it is is knowledge, is getting this knowledge out there in the world. I, I spent a lot of my first, you know, year at Dowie traveling across the United States, talking to people um, about employee ownership, bankers, owner, you know, owners, government officials, and the first question they ask is the question that the person in the chat asked, why haven't I heard this before? And, because it's so intuitive. You're going to get better companies if the interests of the, the workers and the interests of the managers and the interests of the board and the interests of the company and the investors are, are all aligned. And so, and so we can get better companies. We can actually create the, 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 the um, a, a broader wealth spectrum, allow more people to be able to, to, to uh, and, you know, I'm getting back on my soapbox. So the role of <laughs> the role of capital. So ca capital, one reason capital has not been some of the barriers is information and knowledge. How do you you know, if you're a debt provider, how do you underwrite this this type of, of transaction? And people have figured it out. Folks have figured it out. I'm really excited to say, Allison, you mentioned kind of the uptake of CDFIs. You know, we're in partnership with LISC, who's going to help us provide the senior debt for the transactions that we're looking at. So so folks know how to underwrite it. Um, people are able to learn how to underwrite these transactions. And if you're a, an investor, kind of the whole idea of how do we how do we get involved with these transactions while still keeping them employee owned? People have people have figured it out. Um, we're figuring it out. We figured it out. Project A was figured out. A lot of other folks out there. Um, it's just that putting those players on, you know, putting shining lights on those players is important. Um, and the role of capital, in short, you know, when you're dealing with these larger businesses like we're dealing with inside the legacy fund. You know, these are these are, you know, M&A transactions. These are private equity transactions. These are these are businesses of significant size and cash flow um, with owners that that have spent a lot of time, energy and life building up this business and are, and are looking to move on to the next stage of their life. Allison, I think you referenced kind of the silver tsunami. You have this whole world of, of baby boomer owners who are trying to retire and they may they may love the idea and concept of selling their businesses to their workers or or they may not even care, <laughs> right? So some some just wanna move on to the next stage of their life. Um, and if you don't have that mechanism, that capital that's there to allow them to, to peacefully, um, you know, peacefully sell their businesses to their workers and, and go on uh, with their life, then then they're not gonna do it. So um, there have been a lot of owners that have, have done it for more of an altruistic space, but when we're talking about scale, when we're talking about institutional capital coming into the space, we need to be competitive with with private equity. Just to, to be blunt, we need to be competitive with private equity. And as we always say at A and H, the question is not, you know, how are we competitive with private equity? It's it's how is private equity going to be competitive with us? Mm. Love it, love it. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, 
Yeah, it, I, the, just to, to maybe add a couple of points, um, super agree with with everything that you're saying, Todd. Um, you know, the, the capital gaps really are lack of awareness um, is one, right? So everything that, that Todd was talking about, about educating others, you know, I think pretty much every fund that I'm aware of in this it, that specializes in employee ownership or in co-ops has a please come join us mentality to other small business lenders of, you know, participate, co-lend, co like we'll sell you our seasoned loans, like however you want to be involved so that you can gain firsthand experience. We're here for you <laughs> because, because there is this recognition that, you know, all of these specialized funds, we're not going to address the capital gap to really bring this model to scale. Instead, you know, we're addressing the short term capital gap and the need for capital targeted for this in a very specific, you know, M&A style focus on identifying these companies and, and getting them through and, and turning them into employee owned companies. Um, but for this to actually be, you know, what we're working towards is having it be normal, normalized, self generating so that it isn't specialized anymore. We're not needing sessions at SOCAP to talk about it where people say, why haven't I heard about it before? Um, so, so that so that it, it will take the whole small business lending infrastructure to to be able to be comfortable with it, understand the risk profiles, understand that you cannot lend in this space requiring a personal guarantee because you know when you got fifty owners, a hundred owners, who's going to hold the personal guarantee and how is that fair? Um, so, so there's a, a shifting in mindset um, that you know the risk models, all that kind of stuff. Then there's also some some regulation change that needs to happen. You know, banks banks have a specific credit box, a specific set of regulations. Um, and in particular, we need, I'm going to do a little plug here for the Capitals for Cooperative Act. We need the SBA to not require a personal guarantee for loans to co-ops. And I will note that during the pandemic, both the PPP Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which were both um, you know, crisis specific uh, loans to small businesses, both of them waived that personal guarantee for cooperative lending. So we're super hopeful that that um, can serve as a precedent for it to be waived for the SBA 7A loan. Um, you know, there are other things that can that 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 come into play for cooperatives that that benefit um, the risk profile, and so that we can not use the personal guarantee. So personal guarantee is really important. Um, familiarity is really important, and I want to call out a comment that Rodney made, which. Um, which I, I wanted to lift up as well about there. There was recently a, a, a great company in San Diego called Taylor, Taylor Guitars um, that transitioned to become employee owned. And one of the things that I just was so excited about in some of the press coverage about that transition. So it was um, that the financing came from a pension fund and the pension fund was quoted as saying something like, you know, we invested because we saw employee ownership as a low risk investment. And I was like, finally, <laughs> it's true. Like, it's true. It is low risk, right? Like all data study after data study after data study talk about how employee owned companies outperform their peers and do all these things. And yet the capital space sees it as risky simply because of lack of experience with these kinds of transactions. So, so, you know, a pension fund coming in and saying we invested in employee ownership because it was a low risk investment. To me, that is turning the corner in, in, to, in terms of where we need to go for, for capital to be unlocked for employee ownership. And, and I, I want to jump in. You said, said so many, so many great things. And also the shout out to the social capital partners team that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that led that, that Taylor Gadara's transaction, great team over there. Um, and, and I always say it's about, you know, talking more on the banking side, finance side, it, it's about perceived risk versus real risk, right? So yeah. what, what comes to people's mind when they think employee ownership, when they hear cooperative, when they hear these things? And, you know, people always picture, oh, it's, you know, people sitting in a circle singing Kumbaya, you know, and it's, and it's we're not going to get our, our, our money back. And it's like, you know, these are, these are businesses, <laughs> like employee-owned businesses, you know, have shown themselves because of that alignment between workforce and management because they're able to come together during things like a global pandemic and figure out what do we need to do to keep these jobs here and not have this company shut down as opposed to again some traditional you know investment firms or even companies that are saying hey we're now beneath the margins that we need we're going to shut this we're going to shut this thing down and we're or we're going to move the jobs overseas like it it, it makes a ton of sense I, I will say on that perceived risk 
a lot of times from an investment standpoint or, or a finance standpoint or a banking standpoint, you know, the question of, you know, the idea of an owner leaving a company that's been there and now it's, you know, it's, it's worker, are the workers going to be able to continue to, to run and operate this company? I think a lot of the, the, the intermediaries in this space, like ourselves, like, like Project Equity, you know, serving as what we consider to be, you know, stewards, we're going to come in, you know, help transition the business over from an owner over into employee owned business, whether that's finding additional leadership from within the workforce, which is our preference, whether it's help filling in a leadership gap using folks from our team or bringing in leadership from the outside, that that difficulty that comes from a, a, a exiting owner, these teams that serve not just as capital sources, but also as stewards of these businesses to get them to a point where they're able to, to continue operating and grow independently, um, I, I think is one thing that now that we're seeing that in the space, we're going to see a lot more capital. And we have seen a lot more capital excited and, and able to go forward. Great points, Alex. Great point. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with everything you're saying, Todd, in terms of that um, that support. So, you know, just just capital alone <laughs> is not what these businesses need right this is a transition and it's um if you're really doing the transition well you're not just transitioning ownership on paper you're transitioning an ownership mentality yes. within the business right so it's the, the businesses that really really outperform and some of the metrics that we've talked about you know are the ones that have yes ownership on paper also um uh, a significant voice uh, by the employees in terms of the strategic direction of the business and also a deep ownership culture. So you want employees like back to that example of the solar company that we opened with, you know, you want employees when they're on furlough and receiving unemployment, you want them to care about that business succeeding and do everything that they can to make that happen. And that's about culture. And so, so investing in, um, in, in that culture, you know, it's not a flip a switch from one day to the next. So, so, you know, some people call it post-transaction support. You know, we call our program Thrive, where we work with companies two years after the transition, at least um, sometimes more than that, where, you know, it, it, this is an important piece of the puzzle um, to, to kind of bring, bring the reality of what employee ownership can bring um, to life. Thank you all both so much. Um, I, we only have two minutes left. So I guess at this, this point, I'll just ask, you know, anything you want to add. I just want to say one quick thing that, you know, Allison, you talked about that shift in mentality. And I think it's the same thing for invest CDFIs or other folks that want to get in the space. It's just, a shift. I mean, we work with folks who, who want to get rid of the personal guarantee and we have never required it. And for us, it's just not even something that is in our vocabulary. We discussed, we never missed it. We've lent almost $300 million in this space and it's never been a problem, but it's just, it's a shift. And so I think that that's just um, all the, like Todd said, all the mechanisms are in place. It's been done. We know how to do this. It's just accessing the information and getting it out to a broader audience. Um, so I want to thank you all so much for coming. I'll just give Todd and Allison a chance to kind of say a final word and sign off. And just want to thank everyone so much. We're all collaborators in this space and we are, please reach out. We're happy to discuss or connect you with partners. Todd Allison, or Allison. Please, go ahead and keep this up, Allison. And, and I saw in the chat, make sure you, you let people know how to contact, how to contact. Okay. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just want to really thank everyone for joining the session and for your your curiosity and interest in employee ownership. And I think, you know, all three of us are resources. We're here to, to help you learn more if there are more questions or interest in learning more. And in terms of the capital work, I just will say specifically for Project Equity, we have two capital initiatives. One is in partnership with the national CDFI shared capital. Um, they uh, focus on lending to cooperatives of all types, including, you know, employee-owned businesses. And we also just launched a new fund called the Employee Ownership Catalyst Fund, which is designed to, uh, to, to provide a, a really broad range of flexible capital for companies that are either on the path to becoming employee-owned or, um, or are already employee-owned or need transaction financing, whatever it may be. Over to you, Todd. Excellent. I'd like to thank everybody for joining our, our session today. Um, two things that, that stand out to me from the conversation. One, and, and just in life, one, if you're not, you know, if you don't call out um, racial equity, 
If you don't call it out, whatever impact strategy that you're looking at um, and you just assume that it's going to happen by proxy, it's, it's probably not. Make sure that if that's important to you, whatever you're investing in, whoever you're investing in, is not afraid to write it down to put metrics and goals and, and really tie it into their, their mission and strategy. Um, and the second thing it goes back to what Allison was saying. When you're looking at racial equity focused, uh, excuse me, uh, employee ownership focused and centered strategies, if there isn't time, money, effort, energy allocated towards the technical assistance piece to really helping transform a mindset of, of I'm, you know, of a worker into a worker owner. Um, you know, if that's not there and we, we achieve that through our partner, Democracy at Work Institute School for Democratic Management, if that piece is not there, really interrogate that employee ownership strategy um, in, a, in a very real way and ask why that piece isn't there. So those are my two big takeaways. And, and again, thank you, um, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm just was trying to get um, Todd, if you could throw Apis and Heritage uh, um, website on the chat. And again, good to see you all. Thanks for, I know this is the last session of the day. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, have a great evening.